Hi everyone, welcome to the 13th, lucky 13th episode of This Week in Investing in Finance. Just sort of my views of uh, the finance and investing world. Uh, it's July 16th. Quiet um, summer for the markets. Uh, I added a few different metrics to watch that I watch and hopefully you'll start watching. Uh, one thing I noticed is Bitcoin is uh, uh, evaporating as we speak. Um, you know, the only reason this is interesting is is uh, the markets are up a lot and risk seems to be, uh, the markets seem to want risk. So the idea that uh, Bitcoin is down is, is truly interesting. Again, it could be a blip. It could be the beginning of the end. I'm not sure anybody knows. I'm kind of bullish on Bitcoin, so we'll see what happens. Tech is uh, continuing its uh, insane out, uh, nonstop performance. I think it's merited, by the way, but it's still breathtaking nevertheless. Um, the companies in question are delivering the earnings, so um, in many ways, uh, you know, the, the rally is very much meritorious. But um, it's still breathtaking that all you needed to do to beat the market significantly this year was be long uh, tech and short everything else, and you'd be very happy. So um, the most efficiency in our economy comes from these types of companies, and um, that's sort of what's what's driving the success. The dollar is weakening. Uh, kind of across the board. I think people expect that uh, rate increases in Europe and other territories will happen faster than the U.S., which certainly seems to be true. Um, although, again, you know, there's, there's a lot to talk about there. The economy is extremely healthy um, from what bonds are saying, from employment, uh, inflation. Um, we're really in a kind of paradise nirvana type scenario right now. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how that continues to play out. But, um, you know, at the moment, um, at the moment, uh, things are, are looking extremely good. So uh, in any event, um, I guess you guys are telling me the volume is low. Let me see if I can get that a little louder for you. Let me know if that's good or not. So um, in any event, that's sort of what's going on there. A couple things that I thought I'd monitor uh, with you guys a little bit on a weekly basis. Um, the 10 year um, is uh, at 2.33%. I'd like to uh, joke that in an interview, sometimes I'll just look somebody in the eyes and ask them what the 10 year is yielding. And if they're off by too much, I, I won't hire them. Uh, all jokes aside, I mean, you should know what the 10 year bond uh, is yielding uh, and the two year at that. But uh, the tens and the twos and the spread between them is very important. Then I started, uh, I'm adding LIBOR, this is a three month LIBOR, uh, which is 1.3%. Uh, uh, Moody's uh, has this aggregate AA and BBB index, or BAA index, and uh, these are corporates, obviously. So the corporate, uh, corporate bonds are tracking their yields is really important, I'll talk about that in a second. And finally, the so-called TED spread, which is the spread between LIBOR and, uh, and treasuries. Basically, it's, it's the idea that the TED spread will, will widen when banks are experiencing stress. This is a really important uh, thing to watch amongst other things, but uh, the TED spread is actually reaching almost historic lows, I would say. And part of that is the, the great strength that uh, the 2008 uh, recession or depression or whatever you want to call it resulted in a, a, a huge restructuring of banks with Basel III and things like that, such that banks are now uh, almost in, in, impenetrable to risk. Um, of course, uh, we did see a, a Spanish bank fail two weeks ago, so you know maybe it's not totally true, but at least the TED spread is, is contained right now. So anyway, something to think about. So what I thought I'd do is um, do this little chart I made uh, in five minutes that shows rates. And what's interesting about rates is a lot of people, uh, oh yeah, here's one thing I added, which is the S&P 2018 earnings yield. So basically I took the S&P 2018 earnings, which is, and I'll show you how you, how you can do this. Uh, there's multiple ways to do it, but the easiest way is to get the S&P um, uh, earnings for, uh, for 2018, which is published not just on Bloomberg, but in a lot of places. And, and what you're looking for is um, basic earnings. And so um, banks publish this, uh, many folks publish it, and you can see 
that uh, S and P earnings are expected to be one hundred and forty six dollars in um, uh, per share in two thousand and eighteen, and if we um, just do a simple, a lot of people are tempted to do the PE. So you have the index price, and you've got um, the earnings per share forty six. A lot of folks are tempted to do the PE, which is seventeen times earnings, and it's that's not really too in my opinion, too easy to interpret. But if you do it the other way, as an earnings yield, well, this makes a lot more sense. It's, it's basically a 5.94% yield, because this is what you're getting, right, 146, and this is what it costs. So like a bond that costs $1,000, that's paying you a coupon of $50, this is a 5% uh, bond coupon, at least. And um, the thing about the S&P is that those earnings will theoretically grow which makes them even more interesting. So this is sometimes called the Fed model. Um, but in any event, uh, the, um, the point is that I, I think the, uh, the 6 percent yield is real. So that's, that's sort of the S&P uh, 52018 yield. Now, the actual dividend you get, um, companies don't return all of their cash, excess cash to shareholders, obviously, but I don't know that that matters, uh, whether they keep it on the balance sheet, use it in acquisitions, or return it to you. Um, it should be functionally irrelevant, so we'll sort of keep that in mind. Uh, but you can see here that the S&P earnings yield is about 6%. And I tried to stack these up. Obviously, in, in some ways, the S&P... Um, is not a 30-year obligation, so I mean, hypothetically, it's it sort of should belong over maybe here somewhere, maybe able to span this, you know, quite a bit. But as you can see here, um, you have some negative yields in Europe. Uh, the German uh, bonds are yielding negative amounts. Of course, there's priced in deflation over there, but the 10 and the 30 years are yielding positive. This is a normal yield curve, other than the abnormal negative yields. Um, uh, you have LIBOR. You have some of the U.S. bonds here with, again, a normal yield curve. And then as you go up the risk curve, you have corporates that yield higher uh, than, um, than, than uh, treasuries and sovereign bonds, obviously, and then you have uh, these corporates. So this is more junk corporate, and this is more um, well-rated well corporate. But the point I'm trying to make, and here are some junk bonds, uh, Mallinckrodt and Valiant um, are yielding 7 and 9%. One of the things that's important to understand when you think about discount rates um, and there's a reason the word rate is in there, is you're trying to sort of assess the risk of an asset. And you can obviously see like the Valiant bond is, is pretty risky. Valiant may or may not make its interest payments, et cetera. Whereas say the German uh, bonds or the US bonds, these are more, they're, they're probably the same amount of default risk, but their, their inflation component is, is very different where there's inflation here and deflation there. Um, and then you have things like J&J, &J, which really embody equity risk premium more than they embody anything else. And then higher yield stuff like, say, a Regeneron, which isn't too risky, but you never know. Um, anyway, the point is you have to really think about um, bang for the buck when you think about risk and reward. And you can buy Valiant bonds and get 9%. And it's the same maturity as a 2% two, uh, 2 yielding U.S. Treasuries, but totally different risk. Profiles and that just seems very obvious to you, but um, you know, basically, when you when you think about a DCF, if you put a two percent discount rate in your DCF, it'd be quite the interesting DCF. If you put a nine percent interest rate uh, discount rate or a twelve percent discount rate, it'd be quite different. So I think this helps you um, having this in mind sort of helps you think about what discount rates are. And if you take a look at J and J, the inverse earnings yield, if you will, of J and J is is something like, um, in other words, the inverse PE. Um, let's take a look here. J and J is going to earn um, do it this way seven dollars and eleven cents over one hundred and thirty two dollars and sixty cents. So seven uh, seven eleven one hundred thirty two. It's about five percent, about a five percent uh, earnings yield. So I'd rather buy J and J stock and make five percent. Um, than buy the bond and make 2%. Now the bond is senior, uh, of course, to the stock, but I don't think J&J is gonna default. And a 5% yield is a pretty handsome yield. Now, again, when I'm thinking about discount rates, I can think about J&J as a, as, a, as a low discount rate and another company maybe as a higher discount rate, but this, this gives me a, a bit of an opportunity to sort of think about uh, 
um, think about discount rates in your models um, and rates in general. So anyway, we'll move on from that. It's been a quiet month, not a lot going on. Um, Arena had this big news, which we'll talk about, and so did Amicus. Uh, this isn't going to be a very long session, but uh, let's see. So there, there's, again, very, very quiet month. Uh, earning season just about to start next week, so enjoy that. Um, so a little bit of quiet before earning season starts. Um, we got Sangamo, so a lot of you guys have been sending me messages about Sangamo. Very happy you're making money on it. Um, we got Neurotrope is starting to fall apart, uh, finally. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so again, pretty quiet um, month so far, but uh, uh, earnings season begins in full swing uh, probably Monday, uh, or really Tuesday. Most companies don't report on Monday, but Tuesday should begin the harrowing process of tracking all these companies' earnings, and you know, usually you'll get some moves based on whether or not they had a good week. Um, so uh, anyway, uh, I added uh, um, Almiral, uh, which is a, um, a Barcelona company that uh, um, had a really bad sort of blow up. Uh, so we'll talk about that. I mentioned Global Blood once or twice. I'm spending a lot more time on this one. Could be really, really interesting. Everything else is sort of the same. Um, portfolio had a, an amazing week. Um, so uh, pretty much everything worked. Uh, Neurotrope fell a lot. Um, the rest of the shorts kind of hung in there and the longs did uh, really well. So um, um, up 1.4% brings us to 7.11%. And I did a little bit of statistics. Um, 83% win rate, I've invested in about 30 securities uh, this year. Um, and we've had a, you know, an amazing run um, and the median IRR is about 75%, which is pretty pretty amazing. So even though the portfolio has only returned 7%, the IRR has returned um, roughly 75%. And what that means, uh, kind of interestingly, is we've got 7.11%, but you'd have to sort of triple that uh, roughly for the gross exposure being so low. So the gross exposure is pretty low. And then you've got... Um, you know, we sort of had um, uh, four out of six months. So let's see. So we're, we're the adjusted performance for a year. Now this is only half a year would be in the seventy-five percent range. So pretty much the best uh, <laughs> investing I've ever done uh, for these first few months. So some of y'all have been very lucky and and watching this and saying, "Oh, Martin, you're doing." you're doing so well, uh, you know, how could you be doing this well, you know, and, and the, uh, the reality is uh, uh, this may, may or may not last very long, so, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see if that'll continue. Um, but, you know, I, I like these positions, um, they, they all make sense to me, I've vetted them very carefully, um, hoping to add a few more interesting ones, like, uh, you know, if Global Blood checks out, that could be a, a pretty big uh, winner. Um, uh, I think Ironwood and Fibergen could be pretty big uh, shorts uh, that I have to look into a little bit more. Um, you know, I always want to invest more in these in these stocks, but you know, it takes some time to to uh, to sort of uh, make sure that you feel comfortable with them. So, Taro is also I think an intriguing long, uh, but again, you know, there's only so many hours in the day, and and one has to sort of fixate on on completing diligence, which isn't easy. So some of these companies have known for such a long time, it's a little easier, but something like an Avexis really takes an awful lot of time to get comfortable with. Um, and something like a Macrogenics, again, really exciting company, would love to spend more time looking at it um, and learning about it. Um, but uh, again, only so much time in the day. I do have my startups uh, to, to focus on. Uh, but one of the things, again, you might have seen this performance and said it's incredible. Again, assume that it's temporary and you know, uh, I'll sort of revert to mean, if you will. But one of the things that um, um, comes up is, you know, how do you how do you think about uh, your portfolio? Now, 83% win rate is, is very uncommon, but, you know, Warren Buffett has a win rate similar to that, and, and it made me start thinking about something that I think the, the folks at uh, SAC Capital, uh, or 0.72, or whatever they call it now, 
uh, think about, which is this holy sort of triangle of, of how you frame an investor or a trader. Um, so just on the, on the S&P, uh, my IRR is about 75%. Uh, the S&P is up about 10% this year. So you have to think about IRRs. Um, you know, I've only had this portfolio for three months and the gross exposure is about uh, less, less than half. For a while, it was about a third. So if you, you take an aggregate, um, you know, it's been a really, really amazing portfolio. Pretty much every stock has worked. Like I said, 83% win rate. Very, very lucky uh, for that. So anyway, hopefully that explains it to you a little bit more, Shlomo. Um, anyway, the, the triangle is interesting. The, uh, the basic concept is that there's uh, some uh, three variables that explain all traders. And this is sort of what mine's look like, mine looks like. And so the, the idea is that the win-loss accuracy is, is actually pretty easy um, to, to, to succeed at if you don't make many bets throughout the year. So, okay, so like for instance, if you pick three stocks for the year, you said, oh, I'm gonna short Snapchat, um, I'm gonna go long Regeneron, and I'm gonna short Neurotrope, that's gonna have a 100% outcome. I mean, those are three relatively secure calls. Neurotrope is, is basically a fraud uh, Snapchat is very overvalued, and earlier in the year, Regeneron was very, very, very undervalued. Um, so if you if you really focus in on a few stocks for the year, again, maybe you're not going to hit 100%, but something like 80% is very doable and achievable. Now, if you start trading a lot more stocks, say this is a healthcare and tech combined universe, that could be two, three thousand stocks, and let's say you traded five or six hundred of them. Well, you're not going to uh, uh, get a win-loss ratio of 83%. It would it would get closer to 50% or maybe even below 50%. And you can still make money below 50%. These aren't three, you know, clearly you always want your win-loss as high as possible, but these are more three attributes to describe a trader, not to um, um, say that uh, you want all three as, as big as possible, but there's always a slight trade-off. So throughput is, is sort of works on the other side of accuracy, right? You can you can turn over your portfolio and shove more capital through your portfolio um, if you um, focus on uh, more stocks, but it'll, it'll hurt your win-loss ratio. It'll impinge on that. And so these two lines co sort of go against each other. So this is like a Warren Buffett private equity style where I'm gonna pick five or 10 stocks, or in my case, again, 20 or 30, but it's not two or 300. I don't enjoy the diversification of a lot of other portfolios. I've got a big sticky 6% position that didn't look so great when Bloomberg's article came out. Uh, Avexis didn't look so great sometimes. You know, so you're not always uh, gonna enjoy the benefits of diversification if you're gonna focus on accuracy and, and pure success of, of your stock picks. Um, of course, the, the other concept is, is sort of how you stop out your losses. So if every time you're right, you're right by 10x, and every time you're wrong, you're wrong by uh, 10%, and you have a great stop loss somehow, you know, you can, you can increase your throughput in it, um, and your win-loss ratio basically doesn't matter at that point. Um, if, if you're swinging every time you win, it's a home run, uh, and every time you lose, it's not. Now, the opposite often occurs where wins are very small, losses can be very big. Say, like, if you're writing vol, uh, for instance, your win-loss ratio, um, I'll give you a good example. So vol writer is win-loss is 90%, and his turnover is is uh, infinite. You can write every option on the planet, uh, but the problem is that the uh, dollars one dollars lost is is very uh, very adverse. So you you can have a you know sort of two that are really good here, and this one being really bad because um, of the way volatility works. So if you just sell options, uh, this this is sort of where you're going to come out. Um, you still might make money, um, but the concept is is in essence you're just short the VIX in many ways. So in any event, um, you know, that's sort of one, one sort of way to think about it. Um, so, so this is sort of what, what mine looks like. This is more of like a high frequency trader or a quantitative hedge fund has close to inf infinite throughput and velocity, but, but obviously um, uh, the other way, um, you know, uh, there's so many different ways to make money, but this is sort of one of the ways to think about what kind of a trader are you? Uh, and how to maximize all three of these to, to get better success. Um, so there's some news that I thought I'd, I'd mention. Um, Pascal Sorio, um, uh, leaving, staying, AstraZeneca, Teva. Really interesting to see a CEO so lo loved that um, 
stocks move five or six percent, huge companies based on the CEO, pretty cool stuff there. Uh, new antibody approved from J&J, it should hurt AbbVie over the long run. Um, all these new antibodies, second gen immunomodulators, um, maybe make the TNF alphas go away over time. Uh, Roche biosimilars are, are coming. Uh, never thought I'd see the day when I was, it was 2000 and a very young Martin Shkreli was 17 or 18 years old and biosimilars were, were the big threat to the biotech industry. We're, they're finally here 17 years later. So I think that there's going to be some, uh, um, some final uh, um, impact here from, from biosimilars. Having said that, again, you know, it's, it's certainly better than generics. Uh, you know, biosimilars are not going to be as fast eroding as generics, and there are big opportunities for companies like Amgen and Mylan, um, and they're obviously big problems for Roche, but at the same time, um, emicizumab, uh, the new Roche drug, or true guy drug, I should say, is, is some people are saying it could be a $5 billion drug, which is pretty amazing. Uh, the hemophilia space is really undertaking this massive change, and I think uh, companies like Sangamo, I've mentioned before, are, are going to um, have great success, but at the same time, uh, emicizumab um, is definitely an interesting asset and, and could not bode well for, for Sangamo. Again, one has to sort of consider the entire space. Affinity is, was published in the New England Journal. Oh man, what a bad study. Um, pertuzumab is, is really not as good as anyone thought it was gonna be. Um, I can imagine, pertu I have pertuzumab sales stopping here basically in terms of growth uh, and maybe even though we'll reverse. Um, probably the most important news for the week was Amicus's drug, um, Megalostat or whatever you call it. Um, basically the FDA said, first said pre-Trump that they wouldn't approve the drug. This is for a very rare disease and they would need more, no, another phase three. But now uh, the FDA is, um, is uh, uh, willing to approve the drug as is. So pretty amazing reversal of fortune for Amicus. Uh, but it means something for all drug companies, I think. The new uh, FDA commissioner, well, I'll take a step back, most FDA commissioners um, um, are, um, sorry, one second here. Most FDA commissioners don't get involved in um, drug approvals. So what's interesting is, is there's a, a kind of a new sheriff in town, and it seems like uh, Dr. Gottlieb is going to be more uh, involved uh, sort of directly um, with, uh, with FDA approvals, which is somewhat interesting. Uh, anyway, that's sort of, uh, I think, really important news, and, and again, certainly benefited one company to a great uh, degree. Um, there was some interesting data from Cadman and Graph First Host. Uh, that was interesting. Uh, Almeral had a terrible blow up. Uh, shares look pretty cheap. Um, uh, Alnylam and Genzyme reported some data. I thought there were some interesting toxicity signals there. It could bode poorly for Alnylam's entire portfolio. Tassaro is not going to get a buyer, and of course, Arena had some interesting pH data. If any of this was news to you from throughout the week, go back and take a look at it. Really interesting stuff there. Um, not a lot going on in tech. Again, we're waiting on Q2. Um, I noticed Benchmark is trying to sell Uber. That was really intriguing. Uh, PC shipments are lowest since 2007, and one has to wonder if, if in 10 years the word phone or smartphone or small mobile PC we carry around uh, is going to be replaced. Uh, is uh, in this sentence. So again, you know, be wary. You know, only one of these companies uh, really survived as a great success. So um, if you know Samsung, for instance, and Apple are at uh, all-time highs right now, so it's possible um, that it uh, um, could reverse. Um, Uber threw in the towel in Russia and partnered with the Index. Uh, again, somewhat interesting stuff, but again, quiet on the tech front, and I'm very, very busy and couldn't look at all tech news this week. A couple of questions before we call it a day. This will be about a half hour stream. Yeah, rest in peace gateway indeed. Um, uh, someone asked me what I meant by saying the primary care model is broken. Well, it's more empirical. Uh, there's very few primary care drugs that are selling well. Things like drugs for overactive bladder or constipation or obesity or what have you. These drugs just aren't selling well and that's sort of what I meant by that. And Ironwood is sort of the lone company willing to say, no, I think we can still oh, 
we could still sell drugs to the mass market, general practitioner, family practice, doctor. Uh, Steve asked me about the maturity rate. I use the models that most of the maturity rates he sees are in the positive territory, mine are in the negative territory. Well, Steve, um, if you um, standardize your maturity rates across companies and you feel comfortable that the average model you're making leads to a balanced average return, which when you look at my models, they do center, they have a central tendency of around 0% as the average return. That's what you're looking for. You need a system that gets you a 0% return on the average company so that when you do get a big return, you can trust it and when you get a bad return, you can trust it. But the central tendency should be zero. If I added um, points to, of, of growth and maturity to my models, they would overvalue each company. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with my system. And if you look at long-term growth rates for anything, they're not positive usually, uh, net of inflation. So I don't know. Um, Sam asks, are you ever worried about an acquisition messing up your short sale? And it's a cute question. It's clearly a beginner's question, um, but many, many professionals ask about it as well. I never worry about an acquisition blowing up a short thesis. If, if, if a bigger company acquires a company you're short, uh, you made a mistake. Uh, just semantically, you, you, you messed up and it's your fault and that's that. Um, anyway. Um, Let's go to uh, hard to borrow fees. Albert asks about this. It's absolutely true that most uh, great shorts are very hard to borrow, but if you, you, uh, if you uh, add up the uh, fees, you end up getting a uh, um, sort of a good um, return uh, if you're quick about your short. Um, certainly hard to borrow fees are a part of short selling and you have to calculate what you think you're gonna get out of the position. But in my career, hard to borrow fees have definitely, you know, taken out a little bit of my return from shorts, but but not enough that it's it's scared me away from shorting. Um, is there a ceiling on drug prices? Asks Emilio. Um, it's a lot easier when you have a long duration drug. So um, if you have a drug like Solaris, it's a you know five hundred thousand dollar drug or whatever, um, and then the number of years uh, you're expected to take it, or say let's say. 20 years, so the total the tech term, this total cost of ownership is, you know, $9.6 million. Now, if you take a drug like, I don't know, say Daraprim, uh, drug price is $25,000, and the number of years you're supposed to take it is one. You take it one time, and you can see that the total cost of ownership is, is you know, the ratio here, it's not even 1%, right? It's, it's 20 basis points of the same cost. And these are both rare, deadly illnesses. So... Um, the fact that you have to take one of them forever uh, and one of them you can take once, I mean, this is, all, all, you would argue, the better drug, right? Because you, you, you only have to take it once. Uh, but at the same time, um, the market bears this $10 million drug and the market is upset about my $25,000 drug. And part of this is just the optics and natural stupidity of, of the masses. But part of it also is, is this concept that... Um, you know, there is a, a, an upper limit on drug prices to a certain extent. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think that, um, you know, for an acute drug, um, it becomes a little more obvious. Like so if you look at Savaldi is, is around, I don't know, $50,000 net of all fees and things like that. Um, you know, we've seen sort of natural ceilings in this range for an acute care medicine. And we've seen natural ceilings in this range for a chronic medicine. And the market's sort of mysterious. The unseen hand, invisible hand, um, guides us, and uh, that's about all we we really have to go on. But um, there is no practical ceiling to some extent. Uh, Jay asks the favorite investors I follow, and if any stock picks, I'll never buy a stock just because a friend likes it. I think I maybe have one friend like that in the world for the last 20 years that I follow the markets that I will actually follow his or her advice. Uh, without doing my own homework, and I don't, I definitely don't think you should follow anyone's advice. You know, when I, I put out this portfolio, part of it is fun for me to see that I can um, invest very well, and I like to sort of practice um, uh, investing and showing uh, the world how I invest, and, and hopefully I'll learn something, and, and you agree with some of the stock picks, but you shouldn't blindly copy anybody's portfolio, and I certainly don't do it. How fun is investing for you? Um, 
I think anytime you're having too much fun investing, you're probably doing it the wrong way. Uh, investing shouldn't be too much fun. It should be really hard work. I mean, I've mentioned many times that for every 10 or 20 stocks you look at, only one or two of them should be good longs or good shorts. Um, and, and that's not that much fun. Now, if you really love the stories of business, you love the stories of, of um, investing, um, you know, that part is fun. You know, I was reading the Comcast 10K the other day. Uh, it's not the kind of company I usually uh, look at, but it was fun to sort of take a fresh look at a, a company I haven't looked at in many years. And that's fun for me. Um, but at the same time, you know, um, looking for, for stocks uh, and, and doing hours and hours of research uh, shouldn't be too much fun. It is a job um, and it is stressful, so it shouldn't be that much fun. Anyway, that's really it. Um, thanks for everything. Um, I've been reading a lot of medical literature. I'm kind of focusing back on, on my drug assets again. I have a lot of different drug assets around the world and um, I have a ton of uh, research I have to do on those. Uh, I've been reading this book in court, a medicinal chemistry textbook. This is the third textbook I've uh, polished off while in court. Um, if you have any questions, you can always email me. I'm very accessible at martin at thoughtpatrol.com, T-H-O-T-P-A-T-R-O-L.com. If you like this series, I think you'd love uh, our, our new startup, software startup that I'm the CEO of called Godel Systems. Godel is a fascinating new software company based in New York, uh, like I said, that I started and manage. Uh, just go to godel.systems. Uh, to sign up. It's a pretty secretive sign up. You gotta sign a CDA to sign up, but I think you'll enjoy it. Anyway, that's it for me. Thanks so much for um, uh, catching the series and I'll see you again on uh, next Sunday. Bye.